Good morning. Let's go ahead and get started. It is great to see you here this morning. Let's go ahead and stand if you're able to. Let's turn to hymn number three. We're going to start off this morning singing Amazing Grace, hymn number three. Let's lift it up here on that first verse. Now, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. true say amen amen Amen. good singing now let's turn to 488 we're gonna sing a new name written down in glory lift it up on the first now i was once a sinner but i came pardoned to receive i was once a sinner but i came pardoned to receive from my lord I am made whole. Sing it out now. 
It is great to see you here this morning, and uh, we yesterday started our first day back of our regular soul winning and outreach. That was exciting, and uh, excited to get that back started up again. Uh, just a couple reminders for you that are in your bulletin. Uh, the couples retreat is upcoming February 18th, 19th, and then 19th and 20th, and then also there's going to be a uh, Valentine's Day kids party and parents day out. Uh, they're upcoming on Saturday, February the 13th. You can find all the information there in your bulletin. I'm going to go ahead and ask the ushers to come forward, help us to receive the offering. It is great to see you here this morning. It's great to see Mike and Bonnie. We've been praying for you guys and uh, continue to lift them up in prayer with the passing of his dad. I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward, help us with the offering. We'll go ahead and pray, ask the Lord's blessing, and then receive the offering. Lord, thank you again for the day. Thank you for the chance to be here. Lord, thank you for your goodness and your mercies and your compassions that fail not. They're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I pray and ask that you would just bless the offering tonight. Would you bless the gift and the giver? We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. stand one more time now let's turn to 502 502 we're gonna sing and can it be that thou my god just died for me i love this song on that first verse now and can
Christ died for. Amen. Sing it out here on that last one. We get to the acapella or to the chorus. There we go. We're gonna sing it acapella, but make sure you pay attention to these words. I love this verse. Long my imprisoned spirit lay fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. Man, praise the Lord. In fact, say amen if that blesses your heart. Amen. Amen. I think we can do even better than that. If that blesses your heart this morning, say amen. Amen. All right, let's lift it up here on that last now. Long my imprisoned spirit lay. Long my imprisoned spirit lay. Fast back. thankful that God died for you this morning. Say amen. 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 Good singing. You can be seated.
Wonderful, wonderful song, one of my favorite songs. I'd like to ask the boys and girls to be dismissed to junior church at this time. And if you would take your Bibles with me and turn to Luke chapter number 11. <clears throat> Luke chapter number 11. Am I on? Can you hear me okay? Luke chapter number 11. And we're going to begin reading in verse number 42, Luke chapter 11 and verse number 42, and always a privilege and excited to get to open the Bible with you here today. Great, great songs, great singing. I can tell you I've been, I've been really enriched already this morning. It's been helpful. It's been encouraging. It's been invigorating. I am Boy, I'm glad I came to church today. Amen. Hopefully you'll be saying that by the end. Luke chapter 11 and verse number 42. And if you'll stand with me for the reading of God's word, we'll start reading in verse number 39. Luke 11 and verse number 39. The Bible says, Now the Lord said, or and the Lord said unto him, Now do ye Pharisees make clean the outside of the cup and the platter, but your inward part is full of ravening and wickedness. Ye fools, did not he that made that which is without make that which is within also? But rather ye give alms of such things as ye have, and behold, all things are clean unto you. But woe unto you, Pharisees, for ye tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs, and pass over judgment and the love of God. These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. Thank you so much for standing for the reading of God's word. You can be seated. I'd like to, this morning, just preach on the subject, you can do both. You can do both. In Luke chapter 11 and verse number 42, Jesus summarizes one of the major problems the group of people called the Pharisees had. He said, But woe unto you, Pharisees, for ye tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs, and pass over judgment and the love of God. Then he says this, These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. I'd like to again look at that passage of Scripture with you and preach on the subject, you can do both. Let's pray, ask for God's help, and we'll get right into the message. Thank you again, Lord, for the day and for the chance to be here. I pray you take the time that we have and that you would speak to our hearts. And, Lord, I pray that you would just give the help and strength and power of the Holy Spirit. And I pray that you would speak to each one who's here today. If there be somebody who's here today and who is not saved, I pray today would be the day they get saved. And Lord, I pray for every person who is here today as your child who's been saved and help us, I pray, to be faithful to you in the areas that you've commanded us to. We ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. In Luke chapter 11 and verse number 39 to verse 42, Jesus is going to speak about one of the major problems the Pharisees had, and that's they were very, very concerned with what everyone else could see. Now, I, uh, so he says in verse number 39, Now you Pharisees make clean the outside of the cup and the platter, but your inward part is full of ravening and wickedness. Now, thankfully, God's given to me four children to make this illustration real to me all the time. I've got four children, so I have, of course, four dishwashers. And so, Amen. and I mean that. We actually got rid of our actual dishwasher. Maybe we'll get one when our children move out. But I have four. I don't need a fifth one. And so uh, even when the regular dishwasher took its normal time, it took hours and hours. I mean, my four dishwashers move faster than that, so it didn't make sense to keep it. And so anyway, I have four dishwashers. And I happen to be in what I hope is the majority of people who like clean dishes. All right? And so oftentimes, I find myself going to go pick up a bowl or a cup, you know, a platter or a cup. And I'll immediately see the outside of it. That's the very first thing that you can see. And I don't mean to 
to show all of my weirdness to everybody. But, you know, when you get little smudges all over the cup, it's, it's not appealing. You know, when it's nice and clean, it shines. Somebody say amen. I mean, it's just nice, right? I mean, you shine your shoes. You want the dishes to look nice. I mean, it's just nice. When you see all these smudges, you wonder, did this get passed around to everybody? And they all just put their hands on it and then put it away. What happened? I thought it gets dried and it gets put away. But anyway, the first thing I notice is the outside of the cup. It's the very first thing that anybody is going to see when they look at a cup. It's the outside of a cup. It's the outside of the bowl. And so the Pharisees, that really was their specialty. They wanted to look good to everybody when they first glanced at them. And so they very much focused on that and keeping up an appearance. And so there have been times, by the way, that I went to go grab a cup and I immediately disqualified it. That's dirty. That's dirty. I'll see a plate. I wasn't even going to get a plate. And I see food stuck to the outside rim of the plate. Pull that out. That's dirty. That needs to get washed again. And after that happens two or three times, the inevitable question becomes, kids, what do I ask? Who did dishes? Somebody's got to give account for their stewardship. Who, who did dishes? And I'm amazed. It's, it's usually, you know, even the person who did it, it's not their fault. You know, well, I mean, I washed, but it was this person's night to wash. Well, you did it, right? doesn't matter whose night it was. You were the one who did it. You did the crime. Now you do the time. And so, so anyway... I'll pull them out, and <laughs> they'll get disqualified because of that. I think <laughs> everybody would agree, you do want the outside to be clean. You do want the outside to be clean. I, uh, we think, well, while we would agree, you want the outside to be clean, the outside is less important than the inside. Though you should do both. Okay? You get where I'm going today? Yeah. All right. And so uh, my children, I remember there was a particular time, and I don't drink coffee, but I do finally, I found a hot drink that I can really enjoy. I do drink hot tea, and, uh, and then I'll drink chai, chai tea. And so I, I probably drink it daily. I'm sure I drink at least daily. I'm certain I do now, yeah. And, uh, and I love it. Now that it's cold, you know I'm doing at least one a day, and and there's some caffeine in chai, but I don't, I don't know if it's because I don't drink enough or for whatever reason. One of them doesn't. I can drink one before I go to bed. It doesn't make any difference to me. It's just calming, and it's nice, and it's warm. And, you know, I get to appreciate what all the coffee drinkers warms the joy of drinking a hot drink. It's great. I love it. Um, but that being said, I think the thing I use, chai, the latte is a milk-based. I make it out of the Keurig. And, uh, and so if it doesn't get cleaned, it leaves, leaves a film behind. And I have picked up a cup, and I remember, because, you know, like you, probably our cupboard's above eye level or so, and I've grabbed the cup out, and I've seen it shine on the cup, and I thought, I need to find whoever did dishes in this home. They did a great job. The dryer was really on it. Shiny, shiny, clean, clean, glinting in the, and then I bring it down to eye level and look inside, and you see the little residue on the bottom or worse yet, like around the little corners, and you can see where they stuck their little hand in with the cloth and where they washed and where they didn't. Oh, I mean, the outside's important. You want to have a... The outside's what helps you pick the cup up to begin with, but you're going to drink out of it based on what's inside. Now, there's an important thing to remember, and that's that God sees your heart. God sees your heart. People can't. They see the outside. And so we should care about both, but ultimately the Bible method to this is that if you'll focus on the inside, the outside will get where it needs to get. If you'll focus on the inside, the outside will get where it needs to get. And so Jesus says in Luke 11 and verse number 39, Now do you Pharisees make clean the outside of the cup and the platter, but your inward part is full of ravening and wickedness. And so in their case, they were so focused on the externals and doing all of the things that people could see that they neglected the inside and the inside became absolutely full of wickedness. Now I want you to think about this for a second. These were people who the Bible is going to talk about here in a moment were strict tithers. Now, depending on how you may give, most of the ways that people give, especially in church, are largely 
they're largely not public, okay? So let's say you put a tithe envelope in the uh, offering. Well, it could be for a dollar or it could be for $100,000. Know, nobody really knows unless you're just putting a wad of cash and you're counting it as you put in. Nobody knows. If you give online, uh, which we have now, you know, we can go to our website and follow the links to do all that. If you do that, you, you know, you, do, you don't get like a little hologram over your head that says online giver or anything, right? It's not anything that people know. It's largely private. So why would tithing be something that these people cared about? Because in this case, it was absolutely not private. It was very public. They had the offering chest in the front, and when the offering time came, they would carry their offering, and they didn't write checks. I mean, they came in with their cash or with their actual offering of grains or fruits or animals or whatever it was, and everybody knew who gave what, which is what led to, you remember the time where Jesus is watching the offering happen, and he asked the disciples, he says, who do you, who do you think gave the most? And they said, oh, that's hard, you know, I don't know who really gave the most, and they started thinking through, and of course he referred to a woman who threw in a widow who threw in two mites, and how could he have known that? Because everybody could see what everybody gave. The Pharisees cared a lot about what you could see. So when the time for prayer came, boy, they were pro-prayers. And the Bible says they loved to pray standing in the corner of streets and in the synagogues that they may be seen of men. When the time came to read scripture, they would be the first one who'd want to stand and wax eloquent and read the Torah. You know, read the scripture. They loved it. Anything that people could see it mattered to them. It mattered to them that you would wash your hands before you eat. They got on the disciples for that. Well, who knows if you wash your hands or not. It was done publicly and ceremonially. They would wash their hands in these pots, and it would be there that they would cleanse themselves before they eat. Why did it matter? Because people saw it, and it became very important. Those same people who were religious leaders, and the outside mattered so much to them, those same people behind closed doors, sounded worse than the mafia and any thugs you'd ever meet. They conspired, how can we trip up this guy? He's really Jesus. He's really, a lot of people are listening to him and we don't like it. So they came up with ways that they would trap him in words and they essentially like all agreed, okay, I'll take this approach, I'll take this approach, I'll take this approach. Later, when one of the most incredible verses that you'll just read and go, wait, what did I just read? Later, when, when Lazarus is risen from the dead, it causes Jesus to be pretty popular. You know, it was Lazarus come forth, and then it happened. Somebody who had been dead four days comes back from the dead. They actually said, hey, this guy Lazarus, he's a real problem. What are we going to do? And they, these people, the religious leaders said, maybe we ought to kill him. Hey, maybe we ought to kill him. Yeah, hey, that's a good idea. If we kill them, that would really help things. Those same religious leaders conspired. These people who the outside shines so brightly, they conspired and paid off Judas Iscariot to lie. Inside, it was despicable. It was despicable. Jesus said they were, they were like a whited sepulcher. In other words, they'd be like a a grave that had been painted and made beautiful, but the inside's full of death and decay. The outside looked really good. And so I, I say all that to say this. The things that matter, if we go back to verse number 42, he said that they passed over things like judgment and the love of God. Judgment not meaning the condemnation form of judgment, but judgment meaning the ability to discern. So it, it mattered to them how much work could be done on the Sabbath day. It was a day of rest. So they determined how far a person could walk, and they determined what could be done. And so if somebody's animal uh, and their cart turned over, well, that'd be work. We're going to have to leave that. Well, that's just foolish. If I'd liken it to this, it'd be like saying this. Uh, you know, I'm never, ever late to church. Well, what if you drive by a stranded motorist on your way to church? Too bad, I'm never late to church. Because I love God. Well, um, great way to show the love of God is to love people. So driving by a person in need 
would be a good example of missing some of the bigger picture. Okay, for the record, you know, I'm not, I'm not wanting anybody to miss, all right? I'm just saying these are the kind of things they did. And so the Pharisees missed the big things. They didn't have good judgment over things, and they got upset, for example, when Jesus healed a man with a withered hand on the Sabbath day. He could have done that tomorrow. Why did he do that today? Why of all days would he do that today? I mean, that's the kind of guys these were. I mean, they were real winners. Um, and so I said all that to say the inside matters. He, they, they passed over things like the love of God and judgment. Later in Matthew, the companion passage of this, he talks about how they passed over faith. And as God's people, I hope you understand, he wants the inside to be right. He wants us to live right. He wants us to have a heart that loves him, eyes that exercise good judgment, a spirit that is good. Uh, for example, you can do a good thing but have a proud and haughty spirit. And it completely undoes whatever good you were hoping to do. I will go and volunteer. I will help these poor people. I will give them some food. I will serve. I hope they know how lucky they are I'm doing this. That's disgusting. That's despicable. Nobody wants to be helped by a proud person who's rubbing it in their face the whole time. And so uh, the Bible says the inside was completely corrupt, but the outside looked so good. And so there is a danger in focusing all of our spirituality on our externals. There's a danger that comes with that. And so you don't want to determine all of somebody's spirituality based on all the things that you can see because you simply cannot. I mean, you just can't, all right? And so the Pharisees did, and they tried to do that, uh, and they made clean the outside of the platter, and they made clean the outside of the cup, but inside they were absolutely full of ravening and wickedness. Now, that all being said, this passage of Scripture reminds us that it's important for us to have the inside right, but there is something that Jesus mentions in verse number 42 that gets oftentimes overlooked. He says, But woe unto you, Pharisees, for ye tithe mints and rue and all manner of herbs, and pass over judgment and the love of God. Now, what does he mean when he says they tithe mint and rue and all manner of, of herbs? All right, well, this was actually another one of those things that was quite debated. What was the child of God supposed to tithe on? So what is tithe? Well, tithe is a tenth. That's all it means. It's a tithe is a tenth. And so they were to take what God had given them, and they took a tithe of that or a tenth of that, and they gave it to the Lord. There was a time when they would bring that forth when uh, they would come to the synagogue, and they would give it to the Lord. Now, uh, the Bible, for example, in Leviticus chapter 27 talks about this. Leviticus chapter 27 and verse number 30. Leviticus 27 and verse number 30. The Bible says in Leviticus 27 and verse 30, And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's, it is holy unto the Lord. And so when people would tithe, bring the tithe, that would include things like animals, they had this many animals, and they then produced this much, and they had this much value, and they would give a tithe to the Lord. But he said that's not only that. It would even be applicable to the fruit of the trees that you get or the seed of the land. So, for example, if uh, you had orchards or if you had things that brought forth value, uh, you had apples, then you brought tithe of those. If you had grains that you planted, seed of the land, then you'd bring tithe of those. So here was the debate. All right, well, that's animals, that's fruits, that's grains. Those are the primary ways in which we would, you know, we would generate income. But what about lesser things like herbs? Well, even now, herbs aren't expensive unless you buy organic. Okay, but herbs aren't expensive even now. You can go into Walmart or into the herb section of a grocery store and, uh, and, you know, you can find them in bulk, pretty easy to get a hold of. They're not very expensive. But, I mean, they do have some value. They're just not very expensive. 
And so the Pharisees said, well, you know, the Bible doesn't actually say we're supposed to tithe on herbs that they've got value, so we're going to tithe on them. And so the Pharisees would tithe on, the Bible says mint, anise, cumin, and the one we just read, rue is what they talk about. These are all just, it's, it's things like dill. <laughs> you know? I mean, hey, I've got some dill growing in the yard and sprigs of that. And the Pharisees said, uh, you better figure out what a tenth of that is. And you better tithe that too. And they were strict on this stuff. They were highly strict on it, all right? And uh, oh, this was an area of debate. Uh, and, and I think it's funny because the same thing is still a matter of debate. Uh, you know, people debate on what should a Christian tithe on and what shouldn't a Christian tithe on. And, and the answer, by the way, is still what, what God, whatever your increase is, whatever God gives you as an increase, then the tithe is the Lord's. You give a tithe before the Lord. And uh, I do not, um, I don't preach about tithing all the time, uh, but I have determined that at the very least, once a year, I'm going to do it. At the very least, once a year I'm going to do it. Because for years I didn't, and I realized what a disservice I was doing to God's people. For one, not everybody knows to tithe. For two, not everybody even who knows tithes. Right? Not everybody does. It's a challenge. And why does it matter? It matters because in our text that we read, while Jesus is rebuking the Pharisees for the inside full of ravening and wickedness, Jesus Christ in the New Testament says, go back and read our text in Luke 11. While he rebukes them for passing over judgment and the love of God, he says, these ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. In other words, he said, the fact that your tithing is good, but don't leave the other undone. Jesus actually says, the fact that your tithing is right and you ought to do it, but don't pass over judgment and the love of God and faith and all of these other things. In other words, he's saying this, clean the inside and clean the outside. We can do both. Now look, there are some things as a Christian that you do that people can see, and there are some things as a Christian you do that people don't see. What should you do? Yes. Both. Right? You come to church. Do people see that? Yes. Well, I, I just don't like coming to church because it's just a show and you're competing for people and I just think it's, it's completely wrong. No, no, no. There's things that you do that people see, you ought to do them. Then there's things that you do that people don't see, and just because they don't see doesn't matter, you still ought to do them. Yeah. You see, God sees our heart, people see the outside. Either way, we want to do both. We want the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart to be acceptable in thy sight, O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. So that means the thoughts that I think that only God sees should be right, and the words that I say that people hear ought to be right. And so we ought to do both. I'll just mention this, that tithing was commanded in the Old Testament. It was confirmed in the New Testament. And if you think people, the notion to tithe is putting some kind of undue burden on people, study tithing more closely and you'll find out in the Old Testament, not only did they bring a tithe before the Lord, every third year they brought a second tithe that was given to the poor of the land and they had offerings that took place all the time. We're not asking more than they were. The actual Jewish person, if you went back and, and studied it, almost a third of their income was given to the Lord. Anyway, I just thought you'd say amen about that. Um, but all I'm saying is, uh, is that it's important and it matters. And Jesus, while he rebuked the Pharisees for their hearts and that were corrupt and wicked, he actually commended them for the fact they tithed. So I say let's do both. Let's have hearts that are right before God. And why does this matter? It matters because ultimately what we have, God's given to us, and we want to be obedient with what God has given us. And so in Malachi chapter 3, the Bible actually lays out for us what happens when we rob from God. Malachi chapter 3 and uh, verse number 8. <clears throat> Malachi 3, 8. If you can't find Malachi, go to Matthew and flip the page. 
easiest way to find it. It's the last book of the Old Testament. Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But you say, wherein have we robbed thee? And the answer was in tithes and offerings. Now notice what the Bible says. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Let me just pause for a moment and say this. Why God convicted me about not preaching about this is right here. Could you imagine, could you imagine if here you are in life endeavoring to build a home or a family or a life and yet doing it, doing something that brought a curse of God on you. And you came to church and I said, oh, God bless you, God bless you, while knowing you were doing something that brought a curse of God on you. Would I really be a good pastor? I don't think so. Would, would a doctor be a good doctor? If the, you came to the doctor and you said, hey, doc, uh, you know, I, I really want to be healthy, and so the doctor said, okay, well, let me just kind of run through some things and ask you how you're doing then. Are you, know, are you sleeping, you know, eight hours a night? No, I just drink a lot of Red Bull. Um, I sleep about two or three hours, and then I drink a lot of Red Bull to get me through, and then coffee. Praise God. <laughs> that man lives on coffee. <laughs> Every time I see him, he has this large tote. Little, there it is, there it is. <laughs> That's how he's awake in church. I'm not opposed to it. Uh, and uh, he's got his thing of coffee, and he's drinking coffee. And uh, he said, I live on coffee, and I live on Red Bull, and sometimes I just mix coffee and Red Bull. Oh, okay. Um, what about eating? How do you eat? Um, so the snack aisle is my favorite aisle. Like, uh, you know, I just pick up chips, and I get little Debbies. How about things like fruits, vegetables? Oh, no, I don't like those. Oh, okay, all right. Uh, and then, you know, as far as, you know, your health, do you exercise? No, definitely not. I don't exercise. Okay, don't exercise. You don't sleep well. You don't eat well. What are your habits? Well, you know, I do drugs and I smoke and, uh, and I get drunk. And the doctor said, sounds good to me. Yeah, I mean, I, if, as long as you're still alive, right? Good for you. I, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Would that be a good doctor? No. no. You know, doctors, even sometimes, when they're, they're, even sometimes when they're not the most helpful, they try, they're like, you know, you probably should lose weight. I'm like, oh, no, I didn't know that. Thanks for telling me, you know. Yeah, even, even if they're not the most helpful in about it, they're still trying to be helpful. That's their job. I remember when my wife got diagnosed as having celiac disease. And I'm not a good pastor if I'm not, trying to help you do the things that bring the blessing of God and, and telling you to stay away from the things that bring the curse of God. And so I can't, I'm not going to, I can't, I, nobody that knows me thinks that I'm out for money and that's my thing and I live off commission. I've told people this, you realize I don't get commission based on how many people come to church, right? When I encourage you to come to church, it doesn't benefit me. I'm doing it because I care about you. I think it's good for you and it's to be obedient to the Lord. And so what happens when we don't? Well, the Bible says you're cursed with a curse because we've robbed God. We've taken what belongs to him and we've kept it for ourselves. The Bible teaches us that the tithe is the Lord's. And so if we withhold that which is God's, then we're withholding what belongs to him. And so he says, you've robbed me or you've defrauded me in tithes and in offerings. And one of the things that is helpful is to remember that if you see it like that, that the tithe is the Lord's, then you realize that it's not so much a matter of giving my money as much as it is giving to God what's already his. Um, that's what the Bible says in Exodus 13. Sanctify unto me all the firstborn whatsoever openeth the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and of beast, it is mine. And we need to remember that what God says is his belongs to him. Change the perception. Look, 
You say, well, well, nobody knows if I do or if I don't tithe. We don't give in front of everybody. Right, whether it's public or whether it's private, it's still something that we ought to do because it's right before God. I remember the first time, and my parents, I'm so grateful for my parents, they taught me this. Now, they, I'm not trying to make anybody mad here. If you do this, more power to you, right? But I told you it's a debated thing, what you should and shouldn't tithe. So I remember um, sometimes I would get money, sometimes, rarely, for my birthday. My parents were like, you're going to tithe on that. I was like, oh, okay. All right. And so should, do you have to tithe on a gift? Well, that's debatable. I, you know, that, that's, I think that's a little bit of a different area, um, as much as more than things that you've earned that live the increase, but whatever. So they did. And I remember when the first time I got a job and the first time I got a paycheck, I remember thinking, I finally get to tithe. You know, I'd mow lawns and I'd get 20 bucks for mowing lawns and have to go break the 20 and, you know, get five ones and, uh, you know, 10 and a five so that I could give $2 on it and tithe on it. But my parents taught me about tithing, and they made sure that we tithe. They taught it to me from the time I was younger, and it helped me immensely. It helped me immensely. Some of you, your parents didn't do that. Maybe most of you, your parents didn't do that. I think that's really the exception more than the rule. But if you'll learn it, then you can do that favor for the next generation. You can do that favor for them. And I'm so grateful. My, my wife... When I got married, it wasn't a fight for her. In fact, she, in records, and we realized we missed a month. I'm 